customer brought in this Remington Model 742 in 30-06 and asked me to do a partial restoration. Um, the metal itself had a lot of pitting in it and he wanted me to, to take the pitting out polish it down and then put some bluing on it. So I'm going to, I'm going to do that. Um, the receiver's all polished, ready to go. Uh, we've got a light coating of oil on it right now. Uh, just to keep it preserved before it goes into the blue tanks. The, the barrel is all done. The barrel was the worst, uh, a lot of pitting. Um, I wouldn't say that maybe somewhere in this, in this rifle's history, it got some, uh, some blood on the barrel from from deer hunting um, and the customer probably didn't get the blood off fast enough and that's that's the kind of stuff that happens because the blood is very caustic and it will begin to rust and pit the uh, the metal especially where you've got your hand around it. I don't know that that's what's happened but when I look at the type of pitting I'm thinking that's probably probably what what the cause was so <clears throat> the barrel and the action are ready to go. One of the things that I've got left to do is a lot of the small parts. And the small parts sometimes can be the worst. Uh, trying to figure this, this stuff out. Figuring out how to get it polished. And how to hold it while you're getting it polished. The, the end cap, the forearm end cap on this is, is an odd shape. So I need to figure out how to, to do this. And I've, I've, I've actually worked this out. I know what I'm going to do. And uh, I'm going to use this carriage bolt. Carriage bolt has a nice round head on it. And that'll be helpful when I go to file this. Uh, and also when I go to polish it as well. So the nice thing about the carriage bolt is it has these little um, hexes down inside, these little squares down inside that normally bite into to wood. But it helps to center this on the on the um, the part that I'm polishing. So I've had to add a couple washers in here to get the get so I can get beyond those squares. Put this nut in and tighten it all up. Now the plan is to polish this in my lathe. So I'm going to use the threaded portion of the carriage bolt, insert it into the lathe, and then turn the lathe on and it'll spin and I'll be able to file the, file the rust pits and then polish it as well. So my lathe is an older Atlas lathe and I restored this years ago and it's, it's served me well. Uh, it was built somewhere in, I believe, probably the mid to late 30s, maybe into the early 40s. Uh, it's all gear driven. Gets a little noisy sometimes because of the straight cut gears in it, but it's it's just a cool old machine. Uh, so it's got a three jaw chuck, and I am going to just lightly clamp that in that jaw. And what I do know is going to happen is this thing is going to be a little off center, so it'll it'll the hole itself wasn't on center to the to the um, to the part itself, so it's going to be a little bit oblong, but it's not bad. I've already tested this. Uh, there's a bunch of little uh, pitting in it, so I'll use a small file, and I'll take that, that pitting out with the file, and then I'll go over it with sandpaper and get this thing polished up so that it matches the same level of polish as the rest of the gun. So let's get this done. One caution is when you're doing this on a lathe, you want to be really careful that you're not having a death grip on this file because if this file is into your palm and it should catch, it's going to drive itself into your palm. So when I do it, I always hold it very lightly and I hold it off on, a, on an angle so that on the off chance that it does get caught, it's not going to cut, cut into me.
pretty clean. I've got a couple spots in here that that I'm going to have to sort of work at uh, very specifically. So let's let's try and do that. Now, when filing these spots, you want to be real careful that you're constantly moving the file in, in different orientations and then radiusing it as well because you don't want to put flat spots uh, because once you get flat spots they become nearly impossible to get out. Well, they don't get to be impossible to get out but it just adds a workload that, that costs you money at the end. <clears throat> Some of the pitting on this was really pretty deep and I wasn't able to get it all out. The customer knows that, but getting 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 the majority of out of it out makes the makes the firearm look a lot better. Uh, he didn't want to restore the wood, and I was a little surprised at that. But you know what? Um, these things have meaning to people, and. If it didn't, he wouldn't be asking me to do the restoration or to do the reboot. So, you know, the customers figure out what what they want, and you know, within reason, I'm willing to give it to them. You know, the 742 is not a particularly significant firearm in the, in the grand scheme of things. I mean, there are people who really like the, you know, the 740s and the 742s, and that's all good. That's a great, great rifle that Remington made back in the day. All right, let's start it up again. That looks pretty good. I've still got a couple flat spots where, where I was filing it, and most of them are gone. It looks pretty good. So let's uh, drag out the sandpaper and get this thing polished up. So polishing metal is a lot like sanding wood, Matt, but it, it's exactly the same thing. Uh, we're going to start out with a heavier grit, and the idea is that we need to get as much of the... Well, first off, we're going to pull off the rest of the bluing. Second thing is, is we need to start working down. So those file lines that I that I created, we need to get rid of those. Uh, they're not bad because I'm turning it on the lathe. I don't get a lot of lot of uh, file file marks, or file gouging, if you will. But we still have to start working it down to get the polish down. So uh, we're starting with a heavier grit of paper. This is uh, this is actually a piece of a worn hut hundred grit which a lot of the, the sharpness has been taken away. So that, that's going to sort of help not uh, add its own set of lines to the, to the mark that I have to. So that's gonna help by not adding its own set of lines to the, to the metal that I have to pull out. One of the things that I've always done, I learned this years ago, is, is to, never, to never polish dry. I mean, you can, a lot of people do, but I always like to take some kind of a, a light lubricant I usually use just WD-40. It's it's more than enough, and it, it's it's just it's the same as wet sanding. Uh, so the the WD-40 it lubricates the sandpaper. It also helps take away or pull away a lot of the um, contaminants. So those contaminants aren't getting in there and then causing their own sets of problems, which which they will. All right, so let's do this. First polish. good it's taken most of those any of the remaining uh, file marks out so those are gone I'm gonna do this a little bit more just to get this ready for the next grid of sandpaper uh, looks good so I mentioned this in a in a previous video uh, that I have this stick it's probably 
an eighth of an inch thick maybe and uh, I this is my stick I use this for everything I even use it when I'm sanding wood I know I got some oil on it the oil is not going to be a big deal uh, the sandpaper keeps the oil from from touching the wood anyway this is very flexible this is a piece of um, cedar siding I resided my house years ago and this is a piece of um, grade A siding and it, it's perfect it has the perfect flexibility so the nice thing about it is it doesn't create its own flat spots by able being able to sort of bend it around the part whether it's this part or uh, a, a wood part like when I'm working on gun stocks for instance because I can sort of bend that contour it gives me significant more control over over the part and the shaping of the part because of its flexibility anyway I don't know if you can see it in the but you can see a lot of that contamination that I'm pulling off the uh, off the part as opposed to like I said leaving it there to to damage the the surface as I'm doing this <laughs> All right, this looks good. I'm gonna do it just a hair more, and then I'll switch over to the next grit, and I'll bring you back when I do. So much like sanding wood, uh, we're gonna do this in multiple grits of paper, and I'm gonna start out with 180 grit, and that's a fine enough sandpaper that'll take out the scratch marks from this, this more aggressive piece that I started with. From there, I'm going to go to, to 220 and then to 320. When I get to the 220 and the 320, I'm going to use my hands, my thumb, as opposed to using the stick. And the use by using my thumb, what happens is, is it shapes or forms its way around the part better. And then I get, again, like I say, I, I don't want flat spots because when you polish or when you blue this after polishing, if you have flat spots, it's going to show up as a flat spot because the bluing will enhance uh, all of those shapes. So by using my thumb, it softens all the, all the lines or all the, the shadow lines or light lines that, that we're creating. And that makes the, uh, the appearance to be that much more fluid and, and soft looking. All right. So let's start out with the 180. And like I said, we'll start doing that on the stick. So same deal, we're going to use a little WD-40. Actually, come over here, I don't want to spell that shit all over. Alright. Okay, so that's looking really nice. I'm very happy with that. Um, it's actually beginning to reflect light or reflect my image, which is sort of what you're looking for. All right, let me finish up with the uh, 320, and then I'll bring you back, and we'll, talk, we'll look at the part, and we'll talk a little bit more about what we're doing here. <clears throat> All right, so... That pretty much finishes up the polishing on this. I'll take a couple of photos of this and I'll let you see this here in a minute. But uh, when we do this, you know, we need to look at sort of what was the quality of the original finish on the gun? How did Remington do it back in the day? How much money does the customer want to spend to do this work? Uh, in this case, um, I've known Keith for a long time. Keith wasn't looking to have a restoration quality um, work done. He just wanted to freshen the gun up, bring it back to what it looked like when when he first started using it. So uh, Keith didn't want to spend a lot of money on this and I was, I'm trying to respect that and then give him the best quality job that I can uh, for the kind of money that, that he wanted to spend on it. Now, uh, there's other things that we could do. A lot of people would go in and use a polishing wheel with rouge um, I don't do that. It's not that I think it's bad or good. It's just when you start using the rouge, uh, you always have the potential 
for rolling over edges or rolling over the holes, for instance, in a, in a receiver. And I don't like that when that happens, so I like a nice crisp line. So when I do this, I tend to go into finer and finer uh, sandpaper, depending on what, what it is the, the customer is looking for for a finished quality. I can go into 600, 1200, 2400 grit sandpaper and keep working those polishing lines even finer so that when you put the bluing on you get this really mirror-like finish and Keith wasn't looking for that so we've got him a good finish the finish is is such that that the pitting is gone the scratch marks are gone when I put bluing on this uh, it's it's actually gonna look really pretty neat and we're not gonna see see even those 320 uh, sanding lines but you're not gonna get that high high gloss or high polish reflection back but again, like I said, Keith wasn't looking for that, and the gun didn't look like that when it came out of the factory. All right. So usually in my videos, I don't go into a lot of detail. Uh, I've never considered this to be a teaching channel. Uh, I've never wanted it to be that. Uh, I just wanted to bring you all along, show you the work that I do in my shop, and, and intending it to be more entertainment than to be, to be a teaching channel teaching video. It's not, it's not a how-to video channel in, in its strictest sense, but what I am working on right now is setting up uh, a Patreon page. Matter of fact, the page is all set up. I just need to get uh, the final details created. Um, I often get a lot of comments from viewers uh, talking sometimes about, about the quality of the the videos especially focus focus is a really it's a really um, it's important people like to see things sharp and in focus and upgrading to that kind of video equipment it can be expensive I know every guy that goes on patreon tells you the same thing well it's true uh, producing these videos is a lot of work and Getting a good quality, sharp video is is important, but it's expensive. So, I've got one new camera that I bought here a few few months back. It's a it's a DSLR. That's that's a nice camera. My my videos from that camera are sharp, but it's difficult to get multiple ca camera angles with one camera. So I end up having to use the the um, the old Canons that I've been using for forever. They're good cameras, the, the little cannons, but again, they're camcorders. They're not made for producing uh, high quality videos in the sense that you want to upload it to, to YouTube. So some of the things I want to do on Patreon is I want to invest in some, some better cameras. Uh, my lighting, I have soft boxes. I'm using one soft box over here right now to sort of to give enough light. One of the problems with the old cannons is they they don't they're, they're sensitive to light, so if you don't have enough light uh, when you're using them, they, they, they're not happy. So I have to put a lot of light in, um, which is okay, but it sort of begins to look fake and false, which I prefer not it to be. I like to get a, give you guys a, as high quality as I can. So where I'm going with this is that when I get this set up, I'll let you know, and if you're interested, and, and helping me out, uh, one, of the, one of the things that I'm going to, to offer to my patrons, uh, I've been doing this for almost 50 years. I've been doing restorations, gun work. Um, I, I was raised in the industry. Uh, my dad has, has a, a gun shop, Rhodes. Uh, been been a part of that family business since I was a small child. So I... I do this stuff. We have our own ways of doing things, our own techniques, and I'm willing to share some of those, some of those sort of trade secrets, those techniques, um, to my patrons. And I'm going to try and put one of those out a month. I don't know how, if I can do more than that, but I'm thinking one a month, and we'll see, see how that goes. So I'll, I'll spend more time for my patrons, giving more details as to to how we, we in the shop, do, do the things that we do. My, mine is doing restorations. Mine's doing, uh, doing re, re, re blues or trying to get these guns back to, 
back to a better condition. So that that's what I do. That's what I spend my time doing. Um, I'm not a I'm not a gunsmith in the terms of sitting here fixing things. I'll fix things if it's necessary to the restoration. But as a rule, uh, I don't do a lot of a lot of gunsmithing. My dad does. My dad, my uncle, my uncle did. Uh, my uncle passed away here recently. But um, anyway, long story short, if if you're interested in more more detailed videos, then I'm going to do this for those for you that come along onto the uh, onto the Patreon page. So, all that said, thumbs up, like the video, subscribe to the channel, uh, ring the bell so you get notified the next time I post a video, and I'll let you know when the Patreon's up and running if you're interested.